Welcome everyone to the next wonderful installment in our NEMO seminar in honor of Kate Freeman, who is our awardee this year. And we're extremely pleased to have uh, Naomi Levin with us, Associate Professor from the University of Michigan in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. And you started off notably with a bachelor's in both geology and anthropology, a powerful combination that may be foretold of where you ended up <laughs> academically and intellectually. Um, that was at Stanford and then via Arizona, completed a PhD uh, in Utah and uh, postdoc in Caltech, followed by a faculty position at Johns Hopkins. And then you got plucked away to the University of Michigan uh, in 2016. Um, so we're very happy that you're in our neck of the woods. Uh, maybe some interesting collaborations come out of that. Um, fun fact, uh, next week, uh, I'm really happy to hear that you're going to be spending some time in Bolivia, checking out a new Miocene section, doing some sampling. Uh, hopefully that that goes, or next, later this month, goes really well for you. Um, but we are going to be going... Um, looking at a very big topic, which is the interaction between environmental and human evolution and change over 10 million years. And boy, am I excited to, to hear this talk and just pleased that you're here with us today. Great, thanks so much. Today, with, I'm happy wearing my mask. As you are happy to wear you, but what do you guys have protocols or? As the speaker, since you're in front, you can do as you wish. Okay. Uh, anyone in the class, wind if they wish. Yeah. yeah. Um, if you get winded, you can take it. Maybe I'll. It's so funny. I'm so I've lectured so long now with a mask on. So this is like. <laughs> um, well, thanks so much. It's really great to be here, um, and uh, it was really lovely just to be able to take the train here. So it's just like, um, so I, I appreciate that, and I really appreciate this opportunity when uh, to speak. Um, and uh, I wanted to sort of say, like, but a big thing, you know, in honor of Kate Freeman. <laughs> um, but yay, <laughs> in the house. Um, so I actually. I was trying to think about how I know Kate, and it's actually through a couple of different kinds of interactions, and it's primarily through the connection at the University of Utah and the ISO camp course that gets from there in June. And I, Kate was there as an instructor, and I was there as a graduate student and postdoc, then, then baby instructor. And I have just sort of interacted and sort of brushed orbs a little bit with Kate. Um, and I just remember, um, and have been just really influenced by her um, in terms of in our, our scholarship overlaps to a certain degree, but just also in her influence in terms of on science and how to handle oneself. And Kate does this like very big science, broad topics, really creative, really energy, like tons of energy. And she's just also this like, you are this really, <laughs> weird, like you are in this box high. <laughs> um, this uh, uh, like low key, nice, funny, silly, energetic person. And I actually remember growing up in um, my, my field and I was struggling to a certain degree being, I'm like, I, I speak quickly, I'm energetic, I'm enthusiastic, and I don't necessarily fit the mold of this like caster turn field geologist. Like I think that we're, I've spent days with Jay Quaid where we can say a word to each other or he didn't say a word to me and I was just like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> and so Kate, I think I just want to say that there's many different ways to be a scientist and you're, um, it's really great to sort of have another exuberant scientist in the midst um, and to say like, yeah, we can get excited about isotopes and I can explain something really complicated to you with bouncing around doing, doing weird activities in a classroom and having people do funny dances as molecules. Um, and so um, anyway, I, it's nice that, that the plurality of what it means to be a scientist. So I take that from Kate's playbook, and uh, Kate's also just had some really great advice to me as a scientist and as I sort of chart through my um, life. And so it's always nice to, I encourage everybody to either be that person for someone else or to find that person for you. Um, and one last thing is that Kate was also the editor of the um, annual reviews paper that I wrote that I think some people have read. And it's the only first author paper that I've ever written. And at first I was like, I don't know, no, sorry, not first author, single author. If you're like, wow, how did you get tenure name? <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I don't write that many first author papers either. Sorry, single author paper. And at first I was like, Kate said, you don't have to do it if you don't want to. And I said, no, I think I want to. And I think, and then it was like on human evolution and climate change. And I was like, you know what? I think I have something to say about this. 
And it was so awesome just to write something all by myself. And so Kate, I want to thank you for that. And it was just like, I feel like I do, as I'll show you my next slides, a lot, all of my science is super collaborative with lots and lots and lots of people. And it's an amazing opportunity to say, I think I have something to say, and I'm not going to defer to anybody and I'm not going to consult anybody, God damn it. I'm just going to say it. <laughs> so it was really fun. So thanks, Kate. And I feel like we all sort of need space to write that first author and single author paper, I guess. I do occasionally write first author papers. Um, okay, so with that, so thanks, Kate. Um, I'm going to talk about a lot of science that is sort of ongoing and all, a lot of the scientific questions that I'm going to talk about, I started to think about when I was a master's student starting in the year 2000 at the University of Arizona, and I continue to work on these problems. These are my collaborators and teammates on ongoing and current projects that I'll talk a lot about today and sort of where we're going to be going. I'm where my, um, a lot of my research is going next. Um, and so I'll talk about a lot of these people, um, some of whom are, you know, um, where was that pointer, you know, people who I've been collaborating with, you know, when you're a student, you kind of, this is my master's advisor, my PhD advisor, there's a point where you have to stop collaborating with them, then you can get tenure, and then you can start collaborating with them again. So that's been really fun. Um, but then this is just lots of people who I'll talk about at various points, and I'll try not to hit anybody with the star. But this is also a lot of the work that I've done. I just sort of want to recognize where I've come from. Some of these people I still am working with, um, but a variety of different, and I won't even, there's too many names here, but lots of different, these people represent paleontologists and archeologists and geochemists and geologists and paleobiologists. And Kay was just um, uh, entered into the National Academy. I don't know what you call that, but inducted. Um, anyway, so this is a big, many projects, big team. A lot of this work is ongoing and it's because we're tackling big questions with many different kinds of data. Um, and a lot of it is just getting access to field sites and ideas. And um, so, okay, so here we are, grassy, hot, grassier, hotter, and more arid. This is a question. So I want to sort of talk about this. What did we know 25 years ago? What have we learned since? And what do we do next? This is just uh, a, um, actually the main figure from that review paper that I, that I wrote. Um, and in terms of mentioning a lot of the uh, sites of human origin sites in uh, mostly in Eastern Africa, some in Southern Africa, also this is a site in Georgia and a lot of the cores, there's actually many more cores now that have really been coming to light um, but in terms of where the data are from, but this is where, this is where we're going. And I'll really actually talk about Eastern Africa. Um, although there's lots of reasons why the records from Southern Africa are coming up in terms of dating and then just being able to sort of be more creative about how these records um, how these records get generated. And I'll say that I'm just going to, you know, I'm presenting you my slim view of it, but the, this, this topic is so dynamic and people continue to tackle it from many perspectives. So I'll just give you a taste, but it's a filtered taste from, you know, my restaurant, but there's many different other restaurants um, serving some of this kind of food. Okay, so what have we learned yet uh, since and what do we do next? So I'm going to talk about, start with talking about carbon isotopes and teeth and soils. Um, I promise this is actually, there's going to be a little bit of organic isotope geochemistry, but not very much, but you can't avoid it when you tell the story. But mostly I'll be talking about um, carbonates, uh, carbon and oxygen. Um, and I'm going to talk about what we've learned since the past 25 years. So more basins, more facies, different materials, different isotopic tools, and the kinds of things that we're going to do next and some of the building new tools that we're doing. Um, and there's lots of different ways that I work on to sort of get at these stories in terms of, I use fauna a lot. So mammals are complicated, um, but we can use them to track the environments that they're in. And we can also use them to understand, you know, we're trying to actually understand the evolution piece of mammals, humans are, are part of this piece. Um, so we can actually sample that and sort of really also, it's sort of the, an important part of the story. Um, really understanding how flora changes. So, um, I'm really picking up some collaborations with Doris Barboni and Sarah Fekins in terms of understanding the, the sort of floral um, part of the story. I won't talk about it that much, but I really feel like we can actually sample the flora as well, look at soils. And I also, um, part of this work is also, I'm an outcrop field geologist, but there's been a lot of cores recently and sort of how can we think about cores? And actually you can see this, these are cores, these have some uh, uh, horizontal bedding in them. And this is a core, they're uh, paleosols which uh, people, when they want a core and get lake records, they hate these things, but there's actually, we, um, we're reckoning with paleosols and cores as well. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, um, this is actually a book that I bought uh, 
when I started graduate school because this was like the latest. This was this edited volume from 1995. It was only five years old at the time. And this was sort of the story. This was also from Peter Demetta Pal came out. This is in science in 1995. And this was the simple story that's told. And frankly, it's continued to be told because it's so alluring. It's so simple. It's so lovely. And the story goes this list. We see the change in African climate variability with the change in orbital cycles going from sort of a 19 to 23 to 19,000 years as we go from like four and a half million years to the present, 41,000 years sort of cyclicity to 100,000 year cyclicity. We have hominid evolution. We've got sort of this like big radiation kind of happening between uh, the genus Homo and the Australopithecines happening around two and a half million years ago. And we see there was just this little bitty record of soil carbonate data, soil carbonate, uh, carbon isotopes that way is more positive. So grasses are going up like that. So becoming more grassy and it's correlated to glacial and interglacial cycles. So the idea was that the drumbeat, the, the glacial drumbeat was driving human evolution, making things more open and actually inferred from that more arid. And it was a beautiful story because it was so simple. Um, and this is from, this is taking it back a little bit further back going for a paper that Turi wrote in 1992 with a handful of data sets. And remind you, in 1989 was when Turi, came, Turi and Jay came up with these, the idea that you can use soil carbonates and carbon isotopes and soil carbonates to actually learn something about plants that were growing in those soils. So this was basically that study, that concept was three years old at this point. And Turi comes up with this record that shows, oh my goodness, in Eastern Africa going from, you know, the... <laughs> To plot age on a reverse axis, you had to just plot them as negative numbers. That's how simple the, <laughs> the graphics were at that point, right? But um, so you go from you know C3 plants to C4 plants, and this is those mostly um, grass dominating systems in a warm growing season like um, Eastern Africa. So the story of this that C4 plants became dominant in carbonate forming soils really after five million years ago, and then they sort of continue to expand. So they looked at the teeth, and this was also another one of these big stories that came out at this point. Um, this is actually looking at carbon isotopes in age. So we've got 20 million years to the present in each one of these different panels. And carbon isotopes on the um, y-axis, so low to high. So you go from more C4 foods up here. But we see in Pakistan and Eastern Africa and South America, parts of North America, we see around the late Miocene that animals, so these are the elephants are starting to eat C4 plants. Horses are starting to eat C4 plants. Horses, elephants, and this old proboscidean dinosaur, which is now extinct, started to eat C4 plants. So the C4 plants were showing up and they all they, they started eating them right away. Um, so this was a global phenomenon that things were getting, um, these C4 plants, these grasses, were showing up on the scene, things were eating them. Okay. This is a recent paper that confirmed this increase in C4 plants. This is one of the couple panels we'll all show some uh, organic. And I think you guys have heard from Pradiga or you, yeah, okay. And I don't think, I, I guess Pradiga might've talked about a slightly different story, but this is a record from Pradiga that generated from cores um, off, of the, uh, off of the Horn of Africa is 235 and 241 and then on in Western Africa as well. Um, and this is looking at carbon isotopes of leaf waxes going through time. And depending upon the cores, you kind of see it offset in different ways. But the marine cores are also showing this increase in C4 plants. The different colors are showing the distribution of, uh, of biomes today. And he's got a really lovely story here in terms of looking at gradients in the modern, which I won't talk about. But the story is a little bit more complicated than this is a, a paper that Sarah and um, I worked on Sarah Feekins and I worked on. So she's got another, so Prodigus cores are up here. This 231 core is up here. Um, and so Sarah's got this 231 core that's looking at also carbon isotopes in leaf waxes. So you see the increase in C in, um, in carbon isotopes showing increase in C3 plants, I mean, increase in C4 plants, excuse me. But the actual pollen, grass pollen decreases, right? So there actually can be C3 and C3 core grasses, as many of you know. That story is complicated. And then by 2013, we had amassed tons more soil carbonate data at this point. And this is from mostly from a lot of my work up in the Awash and in Turkana. So it's starting to see like, okay, we see the story, but it's not that clean. Um, and we don't sort of, what does it mean ecologically? And how does it vary? I mean, this is a pretty large area. So um, what is the story here? And so one thing I just want to take you on a little bit of a tour to show you sort of our understanding of how these how this story has developed within basins, how the story has developed between basins, because it also is gonna help set up how 
work, the trajectory of the work in terms of understanding our aridity story. So this is a place, the Turkana Basin, which is renowned for its human evolutionary record. I'm actually not going to show you that many pictures of fossils, um, but a lot of our, the record, this is where Richard Leakey got his start in the 60s, um, establishing this, and there was also a French team that came from the, so the, this is the Ethiopia-Kenyan border here. So there's this, uh, the Ethiopian highlands up here, the, the Omo River Valley comes off the Ethiopian highlands and feeds Lake Turkana today. It actually used to have an outlet and connection to the Indian Ocean. And there's three main formations that we can look at. We can look at the Shingura Formation, which is the Axel River system coming in and feeding that basin. We can look at, um, this is also a half robin, so this Nachakumi Formation on the west side is skinny because it's like the steep part, okay? So there's a lot of topography coming off here. And the Kubi Flora Formation, the exposures are broader because it's on the other side of that half robin that's um, not as steep. So we have an opportunity here to actually sort of unpack the story and to understand how the variation in C4 plant um, uh, came to be. So what we did is, uh, so Turi had already sampled this area, but I said, I want to go and I want to go around. We should actually see the C4 expansion should look different depending upon where we sample the basin. And sure enough, these greens are the Shingura formation. So this is more wooded and more open. Um, this is 4 million years to the present. And sure enough, the more um, repairing, the Omo River Valley is actually shows more consistently more C3 as you go through time. Um, and the Nachikui formation is more open and the Kubi 4 formation is sort of somewhere in between. So consistently we get lower carbonate scope values from the Shankara formation and it's probably a repairing woodland. Subsequent work on the fauna has uh, shown this. So it sort of makes sense, but it's important to realize that you just can't you know, we know this, right? You stand on a landscape and you look one way and there's some vegetation and you look another way, it's a different vegetation. But for some reason, as geologists, we go back millions of years and we take one sample and it's representative of a whole entire region or continent. It's ridiculous, but we now have the power to say like, okay, well, let's think about the sedimentology, think about where we are in the basin and actually sample accordingly and appreciate that. The story is messier, but it's a lot more satisfying, okay? So this was this story. We also see this increasing after two million years. There seems to be a shift in C4 plants. So there, um, so C4 plants increase in woody cover, probably decrease throughout the basin. Um, some people attribute that to, you know, global events happening 1.8 million years ago. But the basin also had also a, like a structural basin change at that point as well, right? So in a tectonically active place like Eastern Africa, you've got to really be attentive to these things. So one way to sort of understand is it regional change, is it local change? is to look in a different basin. Um, and so this is where working with lots of different people has paid off. I was also really involved in paleontological projects. This is where I did my master's actually. I, did my, I started to work here at my PhD. And so we were able to build records from the Awash Basin, which is another, this is a triple junction. So the Afar region is an exposed triple junction, right? You've got three plates moving apart. Um, and this is the Gulf of Aden and the Red Sea are also sort of manifestations of that as well. But it's what's exciting about it. It's latitudinally, it's quite different. So Turkana is around four to five degrees. This is 11 degrees north, but they're both being fed by the Ethiopian highlands. Okay, so they're both, you know, being formed. They're river systems. The Awash River is coming from here. It ends in that little lake, Lake Abe, right there. Now it's a terminal lake. Um, but so they both should be sort of telling the beat of the um, of the highlands. And there also happens to be a wonderful record of human evolution there that's continuing to develop. So the Awash records are in white. And what's really interesting about this is that the Awash is consistently has more C4 plants. More, it's more open um, through time than the Turkana Basin. Um, and so it, but it's also in many places it was actually repairing and there's fluvial sediments. These are beautiful finding upward sequences. So just because you were repairing zone doesn't necessarily mean you have more C3 plants. Um, so there's a systematic difference in woody covered by basin. This has also been seen in the fauna as well. Um, we also see a gradual decrease in woody cover since 4 million years. Now remember the expansion to C4 plants was like back at like 7 million years ago, right? So we, C4 plants made it onto the scene and then they just continue to kind of eat their way in and kind of and eat their way in the unlikely places like on the margins of rivers, right? So it's, a, it's an interesting story. So we're now we're seeing, okay, there's a, there's a regional story happening um, but it's different by region and by basin. We also don't see a sharp shift at 2 million years in C4 plants, um, but it's a gradual shift in the, um, in the Awash. 
there's so many parts of the story that I could unpack. I'm sorry, I'm giving you little flavors and tidbits, maybe small, small plates off the menu in terms of what I think about here. But another way to sort of approach this is what is the ecological meaning of C4 plants? Is it like just more grassy? It's like, what does that mean? Um, so one way to approach this is actually, this is a, an effort that Turi spearheaded and there's a long list of authors. This is a big team effort to actually get these fossils to sample fossils through time from the Turkana Basin. Um, many, many, many different taxa. So this is four and a half million years to one million years when the Turkana record sort of really peters off after one million years. And to look at the carbon isotopes of teeth and to split it up in terms of artiodactyls um, and perissodactyls. So this is everything from, you know, warthogs to elephants to rhinos to um, uh, hippos to antelopes. Um, so everything big sort of running around. Um, and what we see here is that there is a proportion of C3 browsers, mixed feeders, and then C4 grazers. And then as you go through time, um, the C4 grazers really start to take over, okay? But this is also quite a bit later. This is at two and a half million years, okay? So it's like, there was lots of C4 vegetation out here, but the animals that were living among the hominids weren't using it in abundance. There weren't actually a lot of grazers. What we know actually is that we've now pushed back hominids eating C4 plants back to this point. They do it also along the same time other primates do it. So there's a lot going on here in terms of, so there's another ecosystem shift that's happening at this time. And what's interesting, Turi has thought about, I mean, there's, there are thousands of data points that go into this, but since you have so many different tacks that he's thought about different ways to think about this, this is putting them on a ternary diagram and saying this would be a C4 dominated grazer, C4 dominated, C3 browser dominated, and a mixed feeding dominated. And as you go through time, you go from more mixed to more grazers. But what's really interesting is these really mixed feeding landscapes that were dominant between in the, in the Pliocene, there's really no analog zone for them today. Um, so there was something about the ecosystems that were structurally different. And I think that this is something that we think about ecosystems, we'd love to call it just more grassy, more open. Whereas functionally, these ecosystems probably function completely differently. And there's a story there that we need to sort of understand. And it's about the mammals, it's about the the plants, it's about water distribution, and also the biogeography of the region and connecting it. Okay, so what have we learned over the past 25 years? The C4 expansion story in Eastern Africa is obviously part of a global phenomenon, but it also continued through the Pleistocene. So it's, the story wasn't finished, wasn't completely written at the end of the Miocene. The distribution of C4 plants depends on location, 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 location. This is a sort of like a duh thing, but uh, now that we know it, now there's no excuse not to actually establish it. So one site is not representative. And the story of how the, the distribution is interesting. There's an ecosystem change in the last 4 million years, and it's not just along a gradient of C3 and C4 vegetation. And then mammals are involved as well, right? Mammals have a huge, like elephants have a huge, you know, these uh, megafauna, of which there are still some remaining in Eastern Africa, have a huge effect on the landscape and vegetation. And they were doing different kinds of things. This is a huge piece that we just don't understand yet, right? But just because we haven't measured it doesn't mean that it wasn't happening. So that's something that we really need to understand. Um, and hominids are part of the story. We actually know, I didn't focus on this, but we've got the data for it, that the hominids are starting to eat more C4 foods at 3.8 million years. And we're just starting to sort of start to figure out who's doing what when. And there's really interesting niche partitioning stories of, um, associated with that. So we now have many more tools to explore this. And I've started to give you a little bit of a tidbit of this sort of unpacking this question of just the grassy part. Um, a big misconception is that when you have sea poor plants and more open environments, well, clearly it's more arid, right? Um, and this is, I, uh, someday I'll meet Mark Maslin and tell him what I pick on him because I do, because he's got in this, so this is a soil carbonate Delta 13C from Turkana and for, so this is a eccentricity, global climate transitions, mid Pleistocene revolution, development of walker circulation, onset of Northern hemispheric glaciation. There's tons of these compilations like this. When the African lakes were common, dust left from the Mediterranean, soil carbonate, carbon isotopes and hominid evolution, trying to like make some sort of sense of environmental external um, drivers of evolution. And this is typically called this is C3 plants must be wet and C4 plants must be dry, okay? Um, and this is, this is often assumed to be the case, or it's just sort of inferred, like a common knowledge. 
but it's wrong. Um, and I think that it was really satisfying. There's some recent papers out that are shown that it's wrong. Um, you know it's wrong when you're on these landscapes and you do field work out there. Because when it's not raining most of the year, it's dry. I, are you a grass and do you like to grow when there's no rain? No, you don't like to grass and grow when there's no rain. Actually, some places when you're in Turkana, which is mean annual precipitation, so less than 200 millimeters a year, it's dry there. It only only see grass there when, when you start to see those rainy events that come up. And then the grass comes up, but mostly it looks like this. This is Nakuru, which is almost a meter of rain, and you have grassiness, um, a lot of grass. <laughs> um, so factors that control C3 and C4 distribution are a lot of things. So carbon dioxide concentration, temperature, disturbance, rainy season, precipitation amount, fire, canopy cover, and herbivore preference. We happen to just think in these pretty simple terms like rainfall amount and temperature, but that's our own limitation of what we can measure and what we can capture in the geologic record. Thanks to a lot of efforts like of Kate's group, you know, we're starting to be able to think about fire. Hopefully, maybe we can start to think about disturbance. We can start to have a more sophisticated sense of when the rains are coming. Um, and some of the work on pump isotopes might be able to sort of help with that. Or people are thinking about canopy cover. So this story of C4 grasses and, and grassiness is, is just more complicated. Um, and we need to think about it a little bit more carefully. So C4 plants and open environments do not necessarily equal dry. Um, and Pradigas paper from 2019 um, sort of laid this out. So this was the hypothesis. This is the same data that I showed you a couple slides ago and an increase in C4 plants um, uh, in the starting the late Miocene. There was a lot of dust records that showed that there was a, um, a dust expansion, but the dust expansion actually happens around six and a half million year, years ago, and it postdates this increase. So um, what Pradega was able to do, which is pretty exciting, is also generate a hydrogen isotope um, distribution from these same cores. And hydrogen isotopes should be indicated, indicative of the amount of precipitation. And there's no traction here. <laughs> there's no correlation here, OK? So there's this offset, which is like, aha. <laughs> there was a part, I'll admit, I saw this. And I was like, I told you so. I knew this had to be. Because <laughs> it just didn't make sense for everything to sort of all of a sudden become arid. And I knew that. Um, and so Pradega has, you know, it could be thinking about, um, oopsies, onset of latitudinal gradients um, in sea surface temperature that could be shifting. The other piece of the story is also carbon dioxide, PCO2, um, which had a drop, likely, in the late Miocene and was also um, dropping, and this is something that needs to be explored, but I actually, it was also dropping in this period as well. Um, and it's possible, I don't have the slides for it, if anybody wants to talk about it, I'm happy to talk about it, but um, it's possible that uh, these environments in Eastern Africa could have been dropping under like a critical threshold for C3 plants in some of these environments um, under the 500 to 300 ppm range in this time period. <laughs> but we have to really consider something other than, so the aridity story kind of starts to fall apart. And then you start to ask like, well, what is what evidence is there for aridity in Eastern Africa? Wait a second. Everybody always cites it like, oh, they do these fancy climate models, and so, and therefore Africa, like the whole continent of Africa, has become more arid. It's like, well, what, what's the data from it, like from African landscapes? The bottom line is, we don't have a lot of data yet from it. <laughs> like, I'm not convinced that we have like some clear data for it. We've got some alluring tips. So this 1992 paper from Turi was like, man, so you know, every time you can you drop a carbonate and acid and you measure that CO2 acid in your mass spec, you get a carbon isotope number, but you also get an oxygen isotope number. Um, these graphs aren't shown as much because they're kind of hard to explain. Um, because a lot of things basically push the can move your delta H in a lever. But what's been seen in Eastern Africa, and it's actually also been seen on other continents as well, as Jay and Turi and many, many others now subsequently have put together the story. And so the oxygen isotope record increases with the carbon isotope record. The easy explanation would be that this is all evaporation. Well, they're just more evaporated, or there's just less rainfall. Um, so what controls the oxygen isotope to soil carbonate record? This has been vexing me for many years, decades now. Um, is it temperature? Anybody who knows carbonate isotope chemistry is that delta H and O values can be influenced by temperature or formation and also the, or the oxygen isotope of the formation water, and that oxygen isotope of formation water can be influenced by evaporation when it's just sitting in whatever that formation pool is. But then even before it gets there, it can also be influenced by all the things that uh, climate, cl climate processes do to precipitation and delta H and O, which is fields of study. So what is driving this? 
And can we get at this? And maybe can we get at this? Um, can we also get at hotter and more arid through these solar carbon, through these oxygen isotopes? Okay, so we started to tackle this, and that same record that I showed you before. So this is the carbon isotope record from different parts of the Tricona Basin and the Awash Basin. And then you take the same, those same samples, the other isotope that we measure, um, we get oxygen isotopes. And the oxygen isotopes show something really uh, vexing and interesting. The AFR, the Awash, doesn't change through time, basically. There's variation, but it's pretty consistent through time. Whereas this, there's this inflection point at around just after 2 million years in the Turkana Basin, and all facies do it, right? So there's some sort of shift that's happening across facies. So what is going on? With just delta H and M carbonate, you're stuck. All you're left with is the part of the discussion that's like, well, it could be A, it could be B, it could be C. We prefer B for this reason. And then you just move on, right? Then we're stuck. So the field, from my perspective, is at a standstill. Um, and so this is as I was finishing up my PhD, and this was in 2000, like, oh, so this is my PhD, which I finished in 2008, and you know how things take a while to come out. Um, but so then just around that time at Caltech, the clumped isotopes were starting to develop in carbonates, and there were some papers out there on triple oxygen isotopes that said that they, they kind of could record something about the hydrologic cycle. And my, my interest was peak, and so this is where things went from there um, to try to track this. Um, this is what soil carbonates look like. This is one of my favorite pictures to use because this is a tuff. Um, so you always want your soil to be well dated, but it's rarely like this. But this is a tuff that basically functionally sort of, and this is a soil below, this tuff like sort of sheared off the top of the soil. And, and functionally, it was probably, and it would, would have, if, if it was an active soil at that point, and so it was probably a, many tuffs in Eastern Africa are actually water laden. They're actually not airfall deposits. They're actually, they, when you've got these eruptions, they basically fill everything and they clog drainages. And then, so many of these tufts have these beautiful ripple marks in the base of them. Okay. So they're catastrophic events, not only be, it's not like totally what you would think of in Mount St. Helens, but it's like they are that, but then they just like fill every sort of nook and cranny of the landscape. Um, and then they get deposited. So they're mostly fluvial deposits and they're slightly reworked, but they're as instantaneous as you get. And then this is a soil. What I like about this soil is you can see a lot of soil features. There's no bedding in here, okay? <laughs> These were forming, forming probably at the top of finding, uh, finding upward sequences. So they started with clay. They're verdict. And so you can see here, sorry, I don't know if the zoom is get this, but you can see these sort of blocks and you can kind of see these lines here. These are what are called uh, pseudo anoclines and they're slick inside on them. So this is shrink swell clays. These are vertisols and they shrink when they fill with water and they, I mean, they swell when they fill with water and then they shrink when they dry up and they slide against each other. Um, and so this is actual, so there's a lot of what we would call pedoturbation and there's oxides forming on the sides here. And then what you've got in this zone, these little things are what I love and what I dig for and I can spend my time. These are soil carbonates. And they're forming in a really distinct zone, which we call the BK. So you've got like leaching at the top of your B, B horizon. You've actually probably lost our A horizon. Um, and then we've got precipitation of carbonates and other and oxides and other things happening in a really distinct zone. And the important part about this zone is that if you're trying to capture processes that happen as like soil carbon and soil CO2 that reflects above ground vegetation, you need to be outside of the realm of atmospheric CO2. So you need to be deep enough in your soil. And so this is why we sort of want to sample things that clearly formed at depth and clearly formed by a soil process. There's a lot of carbonates in these parts, okay? So there's a lot of carbonate that form without a soil process. But if you can identify the genesis of the carbonate, you can get a lot more information from the isotopes, okay? So, um, and now what we're doing is we're sampling stuff for carbonates. And also I've been working a lot with Sarah Peekins and she's also looking at um, uh, the organics and in soils themselves, so the organic isotope geochemistry, and um, Doris Barboni uh, is doing, uh, she's a palynologist, is, has all, all sorts of ways to look at damaged pollen and to do those pollen assessments. So now we're starting to think about, uh, really expand what we do here. So now my samples are bigger and we sort of have this, um, we haven't published it, we've published a little bit on this, but there's a whole sort of realm of things that we can get out of here. Okay, so, 18, so all the carbon isotopes come from, and carbon isotopes of soil carbonates, they come from those kinds of records, discrete carbon horizons and soils. For oxygen isotopes, 
We've got a delta H&O carbonate. It's going to be a function of the delta H&O soil water and your temperature. Um, and that's just a regular equilibrium precipitation of calcite. Okay. Uh, then you've got your delta H&O soil water is a function of evaporation and any kind of soil dynamics. And then your delta H&O precipitation, which is a whole big climate story in and of itself. Okay. So we used to not be able to constrain any of these things. Um, and so this would be our A, B, C, and D of our interpretations. But now we can sort of do a lot better with this. So with clumped isotopes, and I'm not going to define the isotopes here just because, um, but just say this, this capital delta 47, um, this is what's this clumped isotopes. It's this, it's this clumping of 13C and 18O and the same molecule. And that clumping happens, there's, it happens preferentially at cooler temperatures. And so it's a thermodynamic process. Um, and you can use this capital delta 47 number, which I'll call cap 47 or delta 47. Um, you can constrain temperature from that. And you can reconstruct delta H and O soil water from that. And you also have soil temperature, which is phenomenal, <laughs> like a direct measure of temperature of these things, okay? Um, which we're learning is more is a climate indicator, but it's also an ecosystem indicator, okay? So these weren't just thermometers, right? Temperature, soil temperature varies as a function of what's growing in there and what's happening in that soil. We can also use this 17O data, which I'll talk about a little bit to eval evaluate the evaporative enrichment of the delta H of soil water. So we can see how evaporated something is, and then we can reconstruct, we can sort of like peel off the effects of evaporation on delta H and O and reconstruct unevaporated precipitation. It's pretty exciting. Okay. Okay, so here we are. So this is some work. I'm going to start sort of zooming into some modern work. On the left is a panel that Julia Kelson, who's a postdoc working at Michigan now, but she did this work as a PhD student working with Kate Huntington at Washington. She compiled global modern soil carbonates. And this is mean annual air temperature, and this is temperature of clumped isotopes. And what we see here is most clumped isotope temperature of the soil carbonates are warm. So soil carbonates, it's not saying like, oh, there's a bias, they're not usable. No, it's just saying that soil carbonates formed in a warm season in most cases, okay? These different um, colors of these points are summer precipitation, uh, uh, environments that are dominated by summer precip and the blue is environments that are dominated by winter precip. So the first thing that we understand here is temperature. What is temperature? We thought it was mid annual temperature, but it's not. But in some ways it's actually more useful. It's the temperature at which the solar carbonates form, which might be a seasonal bias. So now we're learning not some, we're learning about the season. So that's pretty interesting. So that's okay. So this is what this is telling us. Emily Beverly, who's another postdoc, she's not a faculty member at the University of Houston, um, uh, started to compile data specifically looking at Eastern Africa. And she developed a record from the Serengeti, but she just was highlighting some of where the um, soil carbonates from um, Eastern Africa. We have a little bit of modern data when this was assembled, and they're actually right here. So the Eastern Africa soil carbonates that we have, they're hot. They're really hot, okay? And this is what, so 30 degrees, and this is the, more of a sort of a, um, extended distribution of them. But I'm gonna come back to that plot from Emily in a second. Okay, so these are hot landscapes. So then Passy was at Caltech when the clumped isotopes were just coming together and he was working on the, building the initial clumped isotope automated devices. And he was like, I need samples. <laughs> So we're like, okay, great, let's do the temperature of this record. So this was one of this Patsy Bell 2010 paper was one of the first after there was a couple, but it was one of the early soil, soil carbonate papers, the first soil carbonate and clumped isotope papers, I think, um, or one of the early ones. And this was on these same samples that we looked at here. And we analyzed samples from the Nachakui and Shingura. The gray line is mean annual temperature in Lodoir, which is on the western side of Lake Turkana, which is very similar to warm season temperature in Lodoir. It's hot, hot, hot. <laughs> around the year, it's like 30 degrees hot, super hot. What was interesting is the soil carbonates um, in Turkana were hotter than that. We sort of, they were really hot and they were really surprising. But then when we started to look at this, this is that soil surfaces heat up. There's solar heating of the ground, which makes sense. So it was consistently hot through time and temperatures don't track with vegetation through time or within this basin, okay? So that was something that we just had it. This was, uh, very surprising. Um, and now this is these hot temperatures have been found other in other places in the world as well. Zalal and Badasso did a postdoc with me and we're working on getting, um, he's now a faculty member at University of Dayton. Um, and he then continued to, he did this amazing job working on the um, Awash samples and the soil carbonate stories from there and clumped isotope data. And the Awash samples are also hot. They might show a slight cooling, 
but they're similarly hot. So this hotness isn't necessarily due to um, just their Turkana record. And we see that, so this is uh, mean annual temperatures at Mele, which is one of the closest places in the Afar, which are also hot. Warm season temperatures are even hotter. So as you go north a little bit, the seasonal difference is greater. Um, so these are these temperatures are, are, are they're still hot, but they're still reasonable. Um, if anything, we might see a little bit of an evidence of a cooling year, um, but just maybe an eking out. So we're working on getting this together. Okay. So one question is, is it this hot everywhere? So Emily Beverly, um, she did a, a postdoc actually doing a, a transect of uh, soils in the Serengeti, a modern transect across an aridity gradient vegetation gradient. And she did two things. She did clumped isotope records and uh, 17 0 um, And so these were the different sites that she sampled across this gradient. Okay. Um, so the first thing that she found here, this is getting back to Emily's plot, is the Serengeti soils. The, these are the uh, Kenya and the, the Turkana and uh, Afar soils. The Serengeti soils are quite a bit cooler. Um, and this is important. So this is right off the shores of Lake Victoria. This is really literally on the equator. So what I want to appreciate is that there's a lot of variability within Eastern Africa, okay? <laughs> like considerable variability. So we might have a latitudinal gradient. This also might be an elevational gradient. So today we're actually capturing gradients in temperature within Eastern Africa that reflect gradients in temperature today as well, okay? So um, the soil carbonates, it's not just hot wherever you go, uh, but it happens to be that the Afar Turkana ticket today and in the past were hot as well. Um, I want to just show you a little bit of data to put this into perspective. So, you know, we now have soil carbonate clumped isotope data from the Afar and Turkana over 30 degrees, like between 30 to 40 degrees. This is surprising consistently through. This is some work that we need to get out. This is from some core work that Jessica Mormon did when she was a postdoc working from Alorga Sile in southern Kenya. And she, uh, we actually have soil carbonates in cores. Um, and these were some soil carbonates. Um, that were uh, from between 575 and 300,000 years, so much younger, but these are quite a bit cooler than what Ben was getting in Omer Turkana, okay? Um, so it's possible to get cooler temperatures. This is also, this is closer, this is more uh, southerly, this is to the south. Um, it's possible to get these cooler temperatures. And um, what's interesting about these cooler temperatures is that this is, um, these Orlorga Sile samples are from around in here and they, um, they're all grassy. They're super grassy. Okay, so just because you cool, you have a cooler place that's very grassy. So this disconnect between hot and grassy might not necessarily um, be right, and we really have to understand the ecological sort of components of this. The other record that's out, and this is the only other clumped isotope record that I know from Eastern Africa, is from the shores of Lake Malawi um, by Tina Ludeki, and these are from the late uh, the gosh, they're from around like 2.4 million years ago. Um, and she's got two different records in the Karango Basin, some of which are like the Turkana records. This is Ben's record. Um, and then some are quite cool and more similar to the Lorgas Island record. Serengeti soils are around here, okay? So there's a story here in temperature and ground temperature um, that is just starting to sort of develop. And it's not really what we expected and we're gonna try to have to tease it apart. Okay. Um, so the story from this is that there's no clear secular trends in temperature so far that we've been able to see. There are really distinct regional differences in soil temperature today and in the past. Um, and we don't necessarily see that temperatures tracking vegetation. Okay. Um, so this last little piece, and I'm gonna zoom through this, um, but this is really representing the frontier of my research right now, is using soil, uh, this triple oxygen isotopes to track evaporation. Um, and the way that this works in a really quick nutshell <laughs> is that you've got the delta h and o variation and we know that it can vary by um, on equilibrium processes and kinetic processes and anybody in this room is familiar with d-axis or deuterium you can just replace that on this scale here and it works the same way so there's one relationship between 18o and 17o um, or deuterium delta 2h with equilibrium and there's a more shallow slope i'm holding the star there's a more shallow slope with kinetic processes like evaporation many other kinetic processes as well. This is a handy dandy tool. Um, people have it. This is basically Luz and Barkin sort of came out with a paper about this in waters in 2010. This is, this is hard to measure. These differences are really tiny. This differences in this deviation are per meg differences. So, um, and there, so, and like, for example, for the differences in the slope here, this is the difference between 0.529 and 0.518. You can't even see these differences. 
So we plot them, we actually plot the residual here, and we plot the residual as this cap, cap 17 or capital delta 17 out. So anything on equilibrium should be a straight line, anything kinetic processes evaporation should be this lower slope. Okay, so you just sort of like twist the plot. And the easy targets, we know this works in water, we've done experiments, the easy targets are things that we know are evaporated. Um, and I'm skipping over all of the challenging analytical work that's been done to actually be able to measure this stuff in carbonates. But we can now, and we can also measure it in stuff like cellulose as well. So this is really starting to ramp up. There's a lot of cool stuff that could be done. But for me, my love, my true love, getting back to the soil carbonate question in Eastern Africa, and this is where I want to just talk about in terms of applying this. And um, we've got these, uh, Emily Beverly started to tackle this with her serendipity transect. She sampled soil carbonate, and she also sampled soil water across this transect. And this is a paper that came out in EPSL just recently. Some of the challenges if you sample soil, if you sample soil carbonates, you can reconstruct, you've got temperature, you can measure the clump isotopes of the temperature, and you, you can reconstruct soil water from this gradient. So if you go close to the lake, it's in blue, more precipitation, uh, less evaporation. If you go away from the lake, it's in hot colors. Okay, so this is going towards the lake, away from the lake. No surprise, but the soil carbonate reconstructed soil water from soil carbonates away from the lake, many of them were really high compared to what you would sort of expect precipitation to actually be. So we would interpret that to be an evaporative signal, okay? But there's no way we can test it with just delta 18 0 alone, okay? So there's a huge range in delta 18 0 like a seven per mil range in delta 18 0 more than seven per mil range in delta 18 0 We think it's driven by evaporation. So it could be the same input water, but we don't know. So um, Emily, to just sort of jump to the chase, this was this iridium index, and there's different ways to plot it, whether you plot it as mean annual precipitation over evaporation or PET, potential evaporative transpiration minus MAP. But either way you do it, uh, the, and I should have actually included the schematic here, but lower CAP 17 more of a deviation in CAP 17 is more of these kinetic effects. Less of a deviation um, is more of these equilibrium effects, less evaporation. Um, and so Emily sees it. So she sees that there is this more deviation in these more arid system um, in CAP 17 So it seems like the soils are actually tracking um, evaporation. And actually, so just so you sort of come back here, um, this is what this deviation would. So if something's more evaporated, it should fall down here. Okay, and that's what Emily's saying with those soils. So it seems like it's starting to work. Um, this is sort of what we expected. And, you know, lesson is you do the quick, simple study and then you should never move on because it never is, <laughs> it never gets better than this, right? And that's the true case. So Julia is now a postdoc um, working um, in the lab and she wanted to see if the Serengeti trend extended globally. Um, and so she asked colleagues to send samples because we couldn't go anywhere. Um, and this is what the story is starting to look out. This is the aridity index as a global sort of compilation. The Serengeti samples are right here. This is some samples from the Mojave and the Atacama. So we're really trying to get all over the place. There's some samples, oh, I can't remember, um, uh, from the South Pacific, and I can't remember exactly where they are. But this is, anyway, so this is, um, it's a more complicated story. And I'm just going to zoom through this just to sort of get to the point. Um, so we see locally a gradient. Um, but we can also, this is, there's, there's sort of different scales of thinking about soil water. This is actually, the scales change a little bit because we're reconstructing the soil waters. This is what, on a, this is what meteoric water should look like. So all soils are slightly evaporated, but man, this is split into hyper-arid, arid, semi-arid, humid. It's not looking pretty clean right now. Um, so we, we have some figuring to do in terms of what this global story is telling. It's not what we expected. Um, we do know that arid environments yield lower CAP 17 values. We do know that soil water is lower than meteoric water, so we do know we can detect evaporation. We actually think this is telling us something about carbonate formation. So some carbonates, they don't have to evaporate. They just have to, you have to somehow change the carbonate geochemistry in the soil, right? And you can do that in many different ways. You can dewater by plants. You can also change the pH. You can do many other kinds of things. Um, and we actually think that the 17O is actually gonna tell us about mode of carbonate formation. Um, which is interesting, it's actually more interesting than we thought, but just more complicated. Um, so Jada Langston is just finishing up a master's with me and Milian Mingesha is starting a PhD and they're both tackling CAP 17 in, in, in different carbonates in the Afar in Eastern Africa. And so we are gonna start to, we've actually already analyzed some of these samples for CAP 17 So um, stay tuned because the hunt is still on. And so we're gonna be able to understand what's driving this trend. 
Um, and I'm going to end there. We have, I have an enamel story as well. So we've been doing this with tooth enamel, but um, I'd rather leave it open for questions. Um, so I can, uh, I'm going to skip through here um, and just know it works in teeth and I'll get to my, um, I'll sort of leave it here that it's more, it's more complicated than we thought. So um, I'll take questions. Thanks.